You will hear a conversation about a language course. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning, Borgheimer Language Courses. How may I help you? Oh yes, I contacted you some time ago about following a German course in Germany, and you advised me to take your placement test before we go any further. Well. I've done that now, so I'd like to go ahead with booking the course for this summer, if that's possible. Certainly, sir. You said you took the placement test. What was the result? I was placed at the O3 level. O3, right. That's lower intermediate. Fine, Mister. The answer is level three or lower intermediate. So the course level has been filled in for you. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Peterson, John Peterson. Could you spell that for me, please, Mr. Peterson? P, E, double T, E R, double S O N. That's a double T and a double S. Am I right? That's right. Now, could I ask you where the course takes place? Well, we offer courses in Hamburg and Berlin. For your level, there's never a problem. There are always plenty of people for the intermediate classes. Oh dear, does that mean that there might be a lot of students in my class? I wouldn't be very happy about that. No, don't worry, Mr. Peterson. The maximum class size is twelve, but I've never known there to be more than nine or ten in a class. It could even be five or six. Good. Actually, I'd prefer to study in Berlin. And how long is the course? Three weeks, five hours a day, two hours only on Saturday, Sundays free. I see. And what about accommodation? There you have a choice, Mr. Peterson. You can either stay with a German family who are used to having such guests, or you can stay on the university campus, or we can book you into a nearby bed and breakfast. Is there a big difference in price? Not really. Staying with the family works out the cheapest, and the bed and breakfast is a bit more money. Staying on the university campus comes somewhere between the two, price-wise, but Berlin is not too expensive anyway. Which do you recommend? Well, if you want to practice your German and be part of a German family, I would recommend staying with a family. Our families are all hand-picked, and we've never had any sort of complaint. Yes, I'll probably do that then. What are the dates of the course? The first summer course starts on the first of June in Hamburg, and a week later in Berlin, which is what would concern you, as you have chosen the Berlin course. That's the eighth of June. The next course would begin on the second of July, and then the second of July course would be perfect for me. Can you put me down for it now? Certainly, Mr. Peterson. Can I have your address, please? Twenty-six, Mayfield Drive, Orpington, Kent. I'm afraid I can't remember the postal code. Don't worry, Mr. Peterson. I'll check on it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten.
Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. There are a couple of other things I'd like to ask. Certainly. What do I need to bring on the course? Well, apart from the obvious, you'll need our textbooks. I'll email you the name and publisher. You should be able to find it in your local bookstore. If you do have problems, call me or email me and I'll see what I can do. We provide the computers, computer disks, translation exercises and all that sort of thing, but you will need a good dictionary. We recommend Langenscheid, which is more than adequate for your level. You don't have to go and spend a lot of money on an expensive dictionary. Not yet, anyway. Maybe you will when your German reaches a very high standard. That would be very nice. <laughs> now, finally, what about the cost of the course? And how do I pay? Would you like to pay that in pounds or in euros? Euros would be fine. In that case, it's 550 euros. You can pay by credit card if you like. Oh dear, I'm afraid I haven't got a credit card. How else can I pay? That's not a problem, Mr Pettison. You can pay by bank transfer. Fine. By the way, I forgot to mention I am a full-time student. Have you got a student card? Oh yes. Then that does make a difference, you'll be pleased to hear. You are entitled to 35% off the full price. And if you can persuade a few people to join you, it would work out even cheaper. How do you mean exactly? Well, for every five people you find, one goes free. In other words, if there are six of you, you get one free course. Of course, in reality, you would divide up the savings amongst you, presumably. Right. Well, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> Thank you. Not at all, Mr Pettison, and I'm sure you'll enjoy the course. There are, of course, sightseeing possibilities. Would you like me to send you our brochure describing them? Yes, thank you. I'd appreciate that. Anyway, thanks for your help. If I want to call back, who do I ask for? Susanna. I'm here most of the time. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a salesman giving information to house owners about an alarm system. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Thank you for inviting me to your residence meeting. My name is Martin Pugh from Safe Cell Alarms. I'm going to explain a little bit about home security, and I hope you'll all feel a bit better informed, and perhaps that you will even purchase one of the alarms we sell. It is all too easy these days for people to break into our homes. Did you know that 25% of all burglaries are committed by burglars breaking and entering via the back door? 
Even though it is locked, it is still relatively easy for someone to gain entry. And there are parts of our house that we think are not vulnerable because they look inaccessible. But they're not. So, if you're trying to protect your home, you should make sure the top floor is covered by that protection, not just the ground floor. We believe that the only way to secure your property is by having an alarm fitted. Just having the alarm on the outside can put burglars off. And we also recommend that you warn them about the alarm. To do this, we suggest you stick a sign in the front window of the house so it can be seen clearly. This alone should be enough to dissuade a burglar before they start. Now, our company has a range of alarms on offer, and I brought several along for you to see tonight. But let me just explain a few things about them. First of all, all of our alarms are highly visible. They're colored red, and on the underneath, there is a blue light, which you can see whether they are switched on or not. This acts as a deterrent to burglars who can see it as an active alarm system. Like most systems, our alarms are very sensitive, so you do need to look after them. You may be surprised to hear that a cat can often slink around unnoticed under the infrared beams, but a spider crawling across them will set them off. Also, our system is a little different from some. Most companies offer an option that connects their alarms to the police station. All our alarms have an automatic link to our company office. This means we can deal with a situation promptly and can sort out any alarms that have gone off by mistake. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. OK, let me tell you about the installation of our alarms. Later on, I'll show you some house plans and diagrams of how the alarms operate. But you don't have to worry about them being intrusive, as we normally put them in hallways rather than individual rooms. The diagrams show you how the beams work to cover the whole house in this way. Oh, one small thing while I remember is don't leave your security code in your house. A lot of people keep it in the kitchen or their study, but we suggest you leave it with a neighbor so that if there is a break-in, the burglars can switch the system off. Now, regarding the practical aspects of installation, I know that many of you are out all day, and I'm afraid we don't install the alarms at weekends. But we do offer a service where we can fit the alarm system in the evenings for you. But we do charge a little bit extra for that. Finally, we do offer a range of systems, so I suggest you look at the leaflets on our prices. And please, don't be put off from investing in a more sophisticated system to protect your home, as we do allow you to set up a monthly payment if it's too much in one go. Okay, now, if you'd like to come... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two friends discussing what to study at Mitchford University. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-seven. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-seven. Hello, Gloria. Hi, Paul. I just heard that you're studying psychology this year. At the moment, that's true. But to be honest, I'm not sure exactly what to study. You're in your third year at university. Do you have any advice for me? Well, it's a difficult question for me to answer, but I do have some ideas based upon my personal experience that may be of help. Anything would be helpful at this point. I'm feeling a little worried about what I should do. Well, there are a few things that I would recommend. Firstly, ask yourself what do you really enjoy studying? For example, maths, English, science. This will help you decide what course you should do. The university handbook lists all the courses available. You should take some time to look at it. A couple of my friends spoke with recent graduates of courses which took up a lot of time. Another thing which took a lot of time was an interview at the dean of academic affairs office. They're always so busy there. Unless you've got a lot of time, I wouldn't bother with either of those ideas. Okay, Gloria, I understand there are some excellent publications that I can look at, which will help answer my questions. But the trouble is, I'm having a real hard time locating them. Do you know where I might be able to go? Yes, I encountered this very same problem when I was deciding on what to study. I managed to locate a few excellent books that really helped me to decide what was best for me. Now some of the details will be a little inaccurate. That's no problem. If you could just remember the titles, I'll be able to look them up at the university library. Now let me just get my pen.、Uh, okay, ready? All right. The first book I found was What Should I Do. It was written by Paul Smith, and I believe it was published in 2000 by Smith Brothers. I think this was the best book I read. Although Judy Newton's "Choosing University Courses" was also an excellent help for me. Can you remember what year that one was published? Hmm. Let me see. Most of the books I read were published around the same year, 2000, I think. I can't remember who published it. I think it was Printers Limited. You'll have to check that one out yourself. No problem. This is just what I've been looking for. Anything else you could recommend? Yes, there was one other book which I remember because my cousin works for the publishers Brown and Tate. He started there in 2002. Anyway, the book's called Surviving University and was written by Julie White. It's an excellent book which came out in 2004. I certainly recommend it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-eight to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-eight to thirty. Gloria, this discussion has been so helpful. I wonder if I might ask one more question. Sure. What would you like to know? Well, I'm wondering why you finally decided to study psychology. Well, what helped me to decide was my interest in working with people. I think that's what you've got to really decide in your own mind. Do people give you energy, or do they drain you of energy? I asked my friends what they thought of my idea, and most of them thought it was a good choice. Yeah, you know, I think my parents or family members who know me well would be a good place to start. Hmm. I think if you like to research subjects, you might prefer to work by yourself. That could help you to decide what area you should study. For me, I like working with numbers, and I knew psychology involved a lot of this, so that also helped me to choose my course of study. The bottom line is, you've really got to know what you naturally like to do. Once you work that out, you simply choose areas of study that relate to those things. Well, Gloria, 
I can't thank you enough for your time. Would you be interested in joining me for a coffee? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to listen to a lecture on language learning. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. This is the first in our series of lectures on language learning. The topic I'd like to deal with today is what makes a successful language learner? There's been a lot of research into what makes some people learn a language faster than others. In this lecture, I'll summarize the main findings of the research into the subject. There are many factors that influence how quickly one learns a foreign language, of which exposure to the target language seems to be one of the most important factors to consider. It's this factor which determines the speed of learning a language, especially among those people who learn a foreign language outside the classroom. There are more people who did not learn a second language or a third language in the classroom, and I think that understanding how learners successfully learn languages without the help of a teacher can provide us with the key to how to become a successful language learner. Let's look then at the characteristics of a successful language learner. Motivation seems to be one of the key factors. Research into motivation has identified two main types, instrumental motivation and integrative motivation. Instrumental motivation is the kind of motivation that encourages people to learn a language for practical reasons, such as getting a job or passing an examination. Learners with this kind of motivation intend to use the target language as a tool or instrument to help them achieve a goal. Integrative motivation is what encourages learners to learn a language in order to communicate and socialize with others who speak the language. The primary aim for learners with integrative motivation is to use the language to integrate and identify with the community that uses the language. Immigrants, or people who are married to speakers of another language, are motivated in this way. Although most people have mixed motivation, research into language learning and acquisition suggests that integrative motivation produces much better results and is an important characteristic of successful language learners. Personality is another important factor in language learning. One does not need to be an extrovert to learn a foreign language, but willingness to experiment and take risks is essential. Introverted or anxious learners who are afraid of making mistakes find it harder to learn a language. 
Good language learners will try to experiment with different ways of learning vocabulary or grammar until they find the way that suits them best. Language is a complex system. Successful language learners often design complex learning systems to master a language. They think about how they learn and organize their learning accordingly. They develop their own learning style and use a range of learning skills such as efficient revision techniques, systems for learning and organizing vocabulary, the ability to monitor their own speech, and the ability to plan their learning. Finally, age is another major factor to be borne in mind. Children seem to be in the best position to learn a foreign language rapidly and with the best results. Older learners can also be very successful and become proficient at using a language. Adult learners who make decisions about their learning and are independent of the teacher, who are analytical and aware of how they learn, and who take responsibility for their learning, stand a very good chance of learning a foreign language successfully. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.